You know, um, one of the things I want to say right from the jump, you know, I am thankful that I do have 27 years of marriage with my lovely wife, Alexandra, and I'm very grateful for her being my absolute best friend. I mean, really and truly, we talk about that a lot. And, um, you know, one thing I know for sure, and she will be quick to remind me, is that marriage is truly a school that you do not graduate from. And um, there's still some more to learn, all right? So I dare not stand before you as the know-it-all, okay? There's some of you who are double almost the time that my wife and I have been married, and God bless you. And I hope that you get times to be on the platform to give us the secrets of how God can keep such a beautiful union together. But one of the things I learned is that Jesus was the master teacher. Is that right? But you know what? He taught people that were older than him. Is that true? He taught people that was in the church longer than him. And there was only one reason why Christ had authority when he would teach, even though he was under 35 years old. It was because everything that he said was according to the ancient words. It was because of that. It, he, wasn't, he wasn't talking out of just his 33 and a half years of living, but he knew how to connect his mind with the ancient words. And when he spoke, it was understood that this is not just a man speaking. This is thus saith the Lord. And so I want to walk in that light. And I want to walk in that pattern and in that path as we study this evening when we talk about unity in marriage. I've realized something. And this, again, is, you know, my short years of experience in ministry. One of the things that I do more than preach and teach is counsel. I do a lot of counseling. It, it, it's very involuntary. There are times I go places, I'm just trying to mind my business. But if somebody knows who I am, they're going to say, hey, Dwayne, uh, can I get a few minutes with you? <laughs> you know, and then all of a sudden, it turns into a counseling session. And probably 85 to 90 percent of the counseling that I will do is often with couples that are going through various states of what we'll simply call disunity. In other words, it's very, very prevalent that we're seeing in the ranks of God's people that even though we might be married, there's still often a lack of unity. And this is a very serious problem, that heaven is not the author of it. It is the enemy of souls. And so there's something that is going on amongst the people of God because Jesus knew something that I'm going to show you in just a moment. But I want to let you know that I want you to be very prayerful in your heart. Because we're gonna, there's a lot that we could talk about when we're dealing with the subject of unity, but I can't cover it all in just one message. And so there's just something that I'm going to give that I'll call it foundational, that hopefully by God's grace we can take hold of that foundation, and then we can build off of it and continue to go higher and higher upon Jacob's ladder, ultimately to arrive in the arms of Jesus. Amen? Go to the book of Psalm, the 133rd division. I want you to see something that the Bible says, which is true. Psalm 133, and we're just going to consider verse 1. Psalm, the 133rd division, and we're considering the first verse, and let's notice what the Bible says. Now, when you get there, just simply let me know by saying amen, all right? Psalm 133, and we're considering verse 1. The Bible says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together how? In unity. in unity. I mean, it is beautiful. It is pleasant. It is good when there is unity amongst the brethren. Now, the reality is that the first unity that God did amongst human beings was in none other than the marriage covenant. And the reason we know this to be true is because notice what the Bible says. In Genesis 2 and verse 24, and you'll see that in the New Testament, Jesus reiterated it in Matthew 19 when he was being inquired of as it relates to the subject of divorce. The Bible says, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be what? They shall be one flesh. Well, here it is. You fast forward way down in time. And as you get into the days of Christ, the Pharisees, being the uh, evil-hearted men that they were, always trying to trap Jesus, they come along with a question that they weren't looking for an answer. But I like how Jesus answered it. Now, before we read Matthew 19, 5, let's turn our Bibles there. There's something I want you to see. I was at one of our institutes just a few months ago, uh, Yuchi Pines, 
and I was there speaking for their uh, health week because my, my two favorite subjects is, you know, health and the family. Health and the family. Those are my two favorite subjects when it comes to I always love studying health, and I love studying family in light of last day events. And um, they had me there to speak there, and I did a series called The Seven Questions That Jesus Would Ask. The Seven Questions. And one of the questions is built in this section here in Matthew 19. So I, I want you to see what the Bible says in Matthew, the 19th chapter. And when you get there, just let me know by saying amen. amen. All right. In Matthew 19, we're going to start at verse 1, even though our focus is on verse 5. It says in Matthew 19, starting at verse 1, it says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him and healed them there. And he healed them there. Now watch verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, doing what? Tempting him and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? I love how Jesus answered him. We need to learn how to answer people like Jesus answers. Here it says in verse 4, And he answered and said unto them, what's the first thing that he said? Yeah. Have you not read? Have you not read? I love how Jesus was a master at bringing people back to the text. Have you not read? What did you read? Brothers and sisters, you'd be amazed at how many problems can be solved if we were to simply ask people, have you not read? Did you read? And if they say, yes, I read, then you say, tell me what you read. Is that right? I'm serious. I've learned this in dealing with people. I've learned how to talk less and let them talk more, and they can talk themselves out of error. I've seen that. I've seen that. Seriously, you learn to save a lot of time. And here it is that Jesus says, have you not read? Now, after he said, have you not read, I like the next part to his point. Look what he says next. After he says, have you not read, he says that he that made them when? In the beginning. So first he points them to the scriptures. Have you not read? And then he takes them to the beginning in scripture. You want to know about marriage? Let's go back to the beginning. And here it is that we just read in Genesis 2 that we're looking at the beginning when God made man. And he made them male and female, as it says in verse 4. It says, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them how? Yeah. Sounds to me like Jesus only acknowledged. According to the scripture, at the beginning of time, Jesus only acknowledged two genders. Did you catch that? We're talking about the author, not merely of faith. We're talking about the author of marriage. And Jesus only acknowledges two genders. He says, have you not read that he which made them in the beginning made them male and female? That's it. Now, continuing in verse 5, it then says, and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be what? One flesh. So Jesus reiterated this point about the one flesh. Now, when I look up the word one, we'll see if it goes ahead and works. Until then, we'll just go ahead and I'll talk to you about it. But the word one, literally, when you look up the word one in the Hebrew, it actually means united. When God made marriage... He made it to be between one husband and one wife, and they were to be united. This was God's plan. So the original plan of God is that husbands and wives were created and brought together that they might be united. So whenever we think of unity, when we think of this idea of oneness and so on, one of the reasons for divorce is a lack of unity. Are you following? The reasons for separation, lack of unity. The reasons for the various problems, lack of unity. And when those problems come along, there's something else we need to know. Go to Proverbs 13. This is a very deep foundational point right here because it is true all the time. God wants us to understand that when there's contention between husbands and wives, when there is contention, there's a root cause, there's a root issue. And the Bible spells out the root issue in the book of Proverbs, chapter 13. In Proverbs, the 13th chapter, we find the root issue connected to the contentions 
that husbands and wives often find themselves in. The Bible says it like this. In Proverbs 13 and verse 10, what's the first word? Only. 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 So is there room for anything else? Nope. It says only by pride comes contention. But with the well-advised is wisdom. You see, in Proverbs 13, right there in verse 10, it says only by pride comes contention. That means that when those fights are taking place, yeah, it, it wasn't there before. It was only until it got knocked out. And then once it got knocked out, it's just same, same everything. Let me put it in this one. Let me put it here. Sure. Maybe it got some Jesus print. Well, let's see. Because I don't know. I don't have another one. That's all right. We'll, we'll see. If it, if it works, it works. It doesn't, it doesn't. We're already in the message. So in Proverbs 13 and verse 10, God just simply wants us to know one of the great things that is often found in marriages that will definitely create disunity is pride. Pride is very foundational. This is why in that precious little book, Early Writings, it was on page 119 that it said, if pride and selfishness were removed, five minutes would resolve most difficulties. Can you imagine that? That's early writings, page 119. If pride and selfishness were removed, five minutes would resolve most difficulties. And so here it is that in the beginning when God made marriage, he made marriage in a very beautiful, wonderful, idealistic way. And in that ideal, there was no pride in the picture. That was not part of God's plan. An enemy did that. And so it is that God says, all right, I want my people to be united. This was the great goal of God. And as it was in the beginning, it would start in marriage. That's the first unified effort that God made amongst human beings was in marriage. And then from marriage, it would grow into the family. And from the family, it would grow into society and the community. Well, here it is that Jesus is getting close to the end of his life. And that wonderful chapter, one of the most powerful chapters in all of the New Testament, John 17, when Jesus was praying to the Father, Jesus starts saying all these things to the Father that were very deep. And here was one of the things that he said. He made it very, he gave the formula of how the world can know that he came to the earth to save. He said in John 17, verse 20, neither pray I for these alone. In other words, he's not just praying for the 11 that were present with him. He's making it very clear. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's you and that's me. It then says that they all may be what? One. What's another word for one? Unity or unified. As thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The world does not believe largely in God because of the church. I want you to listen carefully to that. It's, it's a very deep thing to think about. One of the things I like doing is, when I read scripture is I like reading slow and I like thinking through the text. You read slow and you think through the text. And I'm thinking to myself that, wait a minute, Lord, are you suggesting, Father, that one of the reasons there's so much ungodliness in the world is because there's so much ungodliness in the church. When we do not unite with Christ and we do not allow his light to shine through us, beloved, it's not just messing up our lives. It's not just messing up our home. It's messing and affecting society and the world at large. And brothers and sisters, I think that's very deep. I think that's very, very deep. I do not want to be part of the problem. I want to spend the rest of my life being part of the solution. And so Jesus makes it very clear. The world will believe. Oh, they'll believe. They can make all these so-called scientific, these, these science falsely so-called arguments. They can make all those arguments all they want. But once Jesus gets what he wants, I remember I was walking through Australia one time and they were taking me to a lot of institutes that were once used for the glory and honor of God. 
you know? It's a very sad trip. And as I'm walking through and everything else, and I'm just looking, I mean, it's enough to make you cry. But I began to smile. And the, one of the people, the tour guide, they were like, why are you smiling? I said, you know, because my heart has been reminded. In the end, God is going to get what he wants. And I said, and the very fact that these places have shut down is because they refuse to let God get what he wanted. And if we're not careful, but because of the prophetic pen, God has already shown me that he is going to get what he wants in the end. And so the question is not, is God going to get what he wants? The question is, will you be part of it? And will I be part of it? You see, in the end, I've already watched the end of this movie. At the end of this movie, the lamb wins. Amen? Amen. And so we don't have to worry about God's work. and all. God says, don't worry, I'm in charge of all of that. God says, I just want to get more charge over your heart, and God wants to get more charge over my heart. And so unity is so big with God because the lack thereof is the reason why so much negative and evil and sin is happening in our world right now. Well, here it is in verse 21. Christ says, oh, rather, it says in Ephesians 4 and verse 3, endeavoring to keep the what? Unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, this part is very important. Does God want unity? The means by which he accomplishes it is through his Spirit. This is the reason why this should be way more talking about, preaching about, praying for, and living out the presence of God's Spirit in yours and my heart. We need to be talking so much more about our great need, our greatest need, which is the outpouring of the Spirit of the living God. How in the world can we have a happy marriage without the Holy Ghost? I mean, brothers and sisters, are you kidding me? So one of the great foundations is husbands. Are you every day pleading with God for more and still more of his Spirit? Wives, are you crying out to God more and more for an outpouring of his Spirit? I have realized that I cannot be a good father. I cannot be a good husband if I do not have the presence of God's Spirit in my heart. Truly what Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And you have not because you ask not. And if you want my Spirit, the Bible says in Luke 11 and verse 13, you need to ask. Are you asking every day? I'm serious. Are you asking every day, Lord, I need more of your Spirit. I need him. I need him in my heart. I need him in my life because without him, I can't be a good husband. Without him, I can't be a good wife. Even if you try, it'll be like Isaiah 64, verse 6, all over again. All our righteousnesses will come back as filthy rags. And so God wants us to understand unity is what he wants. Unity is the absolute imperative. But at the same time, the only way unity can take place is through the power of his spirit, endeavoring the unity of the spirit. Now, One of the first principles that we should know off the bat is John 16. Let's turn our Bibles there. In John, the 16th chapter, God already helps us understand very foundationally that if the Holy Spirit, or since the Holy Spirit is the one that ultimately brings about the unity, notice what it says in John, we're looking at the 16th chapter now. John, we're looking at chapter 16, and right there in verse 13. The Bible says in John 16 and verse 13, it says, How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you and guide me into what? All All truth. So true unity is always going to be based on truth, not lies. Are you following that? This is going to be a very foundational point. If a husband and a wife are going to unite, it has to be based on God's truth. It has to be based on his words. It has to be led by his spirit. If these things are not the essential fundamentals that are governing a marriage, we are destined to have problems. There's too many brothers that sell out on God to please their wives. It's not going to work. It's temporary. There's too many wives that are prepared to sell out on God while they follow their husbands. It's not going to work. Now, family, I'll start with me. There have been many times that I had to find myself making a decision. Please my wife or please God in this particular decision that I have to make. 
And I have to admit that my record, unfortunately, is stained with times that I chose to please my wife, even though I knew God was saying to go in a very different direction. But the thing that I found out is I am so not alone. I'm not alone. There are so many spouses that will sooner follow their husbands rather than check their own husband and say, honey, I love you, but on this point, you are going against the word of God. And as a result of that, while I love you, I cannot follow you, I cannot join you, and I cannot support you in this particular decision. I'm telling you right now, we lack such wives. We are lacking such husbands that will stand up against your own man or your own woman and say, as much as I love you, I cannot go with you for the sole reason that what you're doing or what you want done is contrary to the words of the living God. How many children are there that while on one side of their brain it says, honor your father and your mother, but they have to remember that Ephesians 6 comes in and says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. And so what happens when a parent is wanting to do something that is not representing that they are in the Lord in that moment? Just like Peter. Y'all remember Peter? Jesus comes along and gives a whole beautiful dialogue about the whole gospel, including his death. But before that, Jesus says, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And Peter responded, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, Peter, I need you to know something. Your natural human instincts did not bring that to your mind. He says, flesh and blood didn't do that. He said, clear as day. He said, my father, which is in heaven. Now, you have to understand that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3 says, no man confesses Christ as Lord, except it be by the Holy Spirit. So in other words, in that story in Matthew 16, 13 through 22, in that story, when Peter gets to the point that he says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, that means Peter's mind was responsive to the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, which is a beautiful thing. But what's deep is in the same exact story. You go just a couple of verses down. Christ starts talking about, I'm going to die. And I'm going to be killed. And then in three days, I'm going to rise again. And Peter, who was just led by the Holy Spirit, now begins rebuking Jesus to his face. And Jesus, I like how the verse says it. It says, the verse says, and Jesus said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. And in a moment, if we're not careful, while we were once being led by the Holy Spirit of God, if you drop our guards, brothers and sisters, listen, I don't do it anymore, but I used to be a, a, a I mean, a serious martial artist. I, I was determined to be the next Bruce Leroy. I mean, seriously, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the best. And I remember that I conditioned myself. My karate teacher told me, he said, Dwayne, he says, I could literally make you, I can make you so responsive that he says, when people move as fast as possible, to you, it'll look like slow motion. And I was like, teach me that. Signed up for it, right? So I would show up at school pretty much seven days a week. I wasn't a Christian or any of that. And I was in school, and guess what? He was right. I have the trophies to prove it. It's like I got good. I mean, I got good. And I got so fast with my legs that I remember that when I used to go up against my opponents, I used to just, like, get into position and just smile at those brothers. And they literally were wondering, like, what you smiling at? And then I would play with their head. And I remember one guy, I was going up against him, and I just looked down like that. Uh -oh. And I wanted him to follow my lead. And he was foolish enough to follow my lead. So when I looked down, he looked down. When he looked back up, my heel was already in his head. And he was down on the ground. As I advanced and became a Christian and put away a lot of those things, God brought that back to my attention. Dwayne, 
as a human being, you conditioned your body so well that all it took was one second of somebody taking their eyes off of you. And you were able to take them down. How much the more that old serpent called the devil and Satan. All he needs is for us just for a moment to take our eyes off of Jesus. And by time we catch our vision again, we've already been knocked down. And as it is true in martial arts, as it is true in various day-to-day experiences in the world, so it is true in marriage. One minute that husband and that wife can be the champion of the children of God. They could be people that evidently represent the most holy place. But if we're not careful, in a moment we can take our eyes off of Jesus, even in our marriages, and we can be used by the enemy. And rather than leading our family and our spouses towards that which is holy and sacred and eternal, we can lead them to that which is unholy, devastating and devilish, and detrimental. We need to understand the only hope we have is the presence of God's Spirit. Continually guiding our minds. Now, when I looked at this whole thing about the unity of the Spirit, you know, again, unity means oneness, which I thought was very interesting. So again, it's interchangeable. So the idea of God is he says, look, I can bring my people together, but he says the way that I do it is through oneness. And unanimity is actually agreement by all people involved, a consensus. This is what God says he wants between husbands and wives. This is what God wants for his people. Then I went to the words of inspiration, and I found out how much God wants me to be united. Go to the book of Philippians chapter 2. I, I always, you know, I always wanted to say, Lord, how serious are you about this, right? Because does my wife have to see everything the way I see it? Because personally, I don't want to marry another Dwayne Lemon. I promise you, the world only needs one Dwayne Lemon. It doesn't need any more. And I definitely don't want to be married to me. So I'm thinking, Father, how much do you want Alexandra to be one with me, right? So here it is. I go to Philippians 2. It was a principle here. In Philippians, the second chapter... I like this. This is really good. And when you read it, it it, it just gives you a gauge, right? It gives more context to verse 5, which we quote often. It says in Philippians 2, starting at verse 1, if you're there, please say amen. Amen. It says in Philippians 2 and verse 1, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that you be what? like-minded, having the same what? Love, being of one accord, of one mind. Now, when I read this, I wanted to understand how much am I supposed to have, where, where, what are the limits to the oneness that I'm having with my beloved, right? Because there's some things that I think is pretty cool about my relationship with my wife. Like, we can both be in a room, we can see everything going on, and I don't even have to look at her, and I'll be like, did you catch that? She'll be like, yep. And I'm just like, see, I like that. Like, literally, we have high-level sensitivity and observation on the things that count. And so I enjoy that oneness. But again, I don't want to be married to another Dwayne Lemon. So what, what's the limit to this oneness? So then I was reading this quote, and I want you to check this quote out. This quote is very powerful. It says, in these first disciples were presented marked diversity. They were to be the world's teachers, and they represented widely varied types of character. Okay? Then it says this. In order successfully to carry forward the work to which they had been called, these men, differing in natural characteristics and in habits of life, needed to come into unity of three things. What were they? Feeling, thought, and action. This unity, it was Christ's object to secure. To this end, he sought to bring them into unity with himself. So that means that God not only wants this in relation to his disciples, you and I, How much the more 
God wants this to be a reality with me and my beloved. God says, I want you to be one in thought, feelings, and actions. How are we doing with that? How are we doing with that, y'all? We doing all right with that? I want you to think about that. That's the goal. That's the goal that God says. I want you to be so united with your wife. I want you to be so united with your husband that you begin to partake and share in the thoughts that he has and the thoughts that she has. You begin to partake and share in the feelings she has and the feelings he has. You begin to partake and you begin to share in the actions that he would do and the actions that she would do. And if you're not there, behold your homework. I mean, isn't that something? If you're not there, God said, that's all right. Because again, marriage is a school. And there's no graduation, but we should advance in the classes. And God says, your homework is I want you to learn how to be more united in thought with him and her, in feelings with him and her. Have you ever had something happen amongst your wife and you're like, I can't relate to this at all? I don't know what you're talking about. Or you might say, I don't see what the big deal is. That's your problem, not my problem. God says, I have a different attitude towards this. God says, this is what I want. Why? Because the Lord understands something. You see, for God, marriage is about making the gospel known. Are you following that? Let me prove it. Ephesians 5, right? Ephesians 5. When you go to Ephesians 5, God already makes the thing clear as day, right? Because in Ephesians 5, you remember in verse 22, the apostle Paul starts talking to the wives. And he says to the wives, wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, right? You know? So he gives counsel to the wives, submit yourself to your husband. Then you get down to verse 25 and he says, husbands, love your wives. A, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. We're going to pick up on that tomorrow. So here it is that Paul has given all this family counsel. And what's deep is Paul was single teaching people how to be married. And again, why was Paul qualified? Why should we listen to him? It's because rather than speaking from his experience, he rather spoke in context with the ancient words. Remember that? So that's good news to all the single people. You can actually give married people counsel just like Paul. Just make sure that it's not based on your experience because you have none. But you can definitely say it's based on the word of the living God. And then it's authoritative. Amen? Amen. Now, after Paul says to the wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands, like the church submits itself to Christ and is the head of the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. After he goes through all this family council, verse 32 In verse 32 of the same book and chapter, it says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning what? Christ and the church. All of that, wives act this way, husbands act this way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He says, if you do this, you'll understand better how Christ relates to the church and how the church relates to Christ. And I am convinced that one of the reasons why so many marriages are broken is because we don't have a good enough understanding, according to the word of God, of the church's role to Christ and Christ's role to the church. Listen carefully to what I just said. If you're not intelligent on understanding the church's role and relation to Christ, and you don't understand Christ and his role and relation to the church, how could you possibly understand marriage? The whole purpose of marriage was that we may learn and emulate, that we might show what the relationship between Christ and the church looks like. And if husband and wife understood, well, that means that everything I do, it's more than just what I feel and what I think. I am representing the relationship between Christ and the church. 
And that's why it's so tragic, especially when husbands and wives get into fights before their children. You don't understand. You're giving the children a wrong picture of the gospel. And if you don't know the Bible well, God takes giving wrong representations of the gospel very serious. If you don't believe me, ask our brother Moses. When God told Moses on that wilderness journey, God said, Moses, I want you to strike the rock. And then he says, and life's going to come out of it. Moses obeyed. Moses took the rod, struck the rock. Life came out of it, the source of life, that water, right? God was like, well done. Perfect, because that's exactly the picture of what's going to happen with my son. But then, as the journey continued, Moses obviously is getting very agitated and irritated and frustrated with the people of God. And for, as they call it, a New York second, (laughs) Moses lost his focus. And when our brother Moses lost that focus, and he started saying, must we fetch you this water? And he's now looking to himself rather than looking in the other direction. When God told him to speak to the rock, Moses instead struck the rock, and he struck it twice. That, people need to realize, was a misrepresentation of the gospel before a whole lot of people that God was trying to teach the gospel through, through symbols and types. Because Jesus was stricken once. And after he was stricken once, then every other time we speak to him through prayer. And then we receive what we need to receive from him. That was the gospel picture. Moses messed it up. And so what does God say? Because of that, he says, you cannot enter into the Canaan land. And even when Moses came back later on, please, please, Lord, please, like a little child begs their parents. God not only said no, he said, don't ask me again. So here goes Moses in that quiet moment up there with his brother Joshua and giving him some final counsel. You know how these folks are now. I'm handing the baton off to you. And I can only imagine how solemn that scene was where Joshua and Moses embrace each other for the last time. Here it is, Joshua's leaving, and Moses is there. He has accepted the punishment of God. And now Moses is by himself, and I would imagine he's contemplating much, and the Bible says Moses dies. Here's the part that touches my heart of that story. I see Moses breathing his last breath. And I don't know exactly how the story goes, but to some extent, Moses is able to hear a voice say, Moses, get up. Moses wakes up out of his death sleep, and he sees Christ, the resurrection. And the Bible lets us know in Hebrews 6, That God is not unrighteous, that he will forget the labors of those who labored on him, his behalf. And so God wakes Moses up and God says to him, let's go. And Moses says, where are we going? And God says, Canaan. And you can imagine where Moses is saying, but wait a minute, I I thought you said we can't go. God says, yeah, I was talking about the type. I'm taking you to the real thing. God is good all the time. He's not unrighteous that he forgot his saint. He said, Moses, I know those stiff-necked people. He says, I know the role they play. He said, you messed up the story of the gospel, son. I had to work on that with you. But he says, but I still have my reward. I was going to translate you. But he said, but this time I have to resurrect you instead. I'm so glad we serve a righteous God. You see, we, 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 we are called to demonstrate the gospel in our marriages. And like me, I know there's a lot, and I know I'm not by myself on this, there's a lot of us that we failed, we messed up, and we did not represent as we should. But God is not unrighteous. 
that he forgets the labors of his saints. He knows the trials that we face. He remembers our frames. He knows that we are dust. And so the Lord comes along and says, all right, let's try this again. And he begins to work with us and show us again. And I believe he's making that appeal even tonight. And so the reality is, is that God is calling us to a higher unity than perhaps we have ever sought to have with one another because it is a solemn thing to think that God has raised me up and brought Alexandra into my life that I can become united with her in thought, in feeling, and in actions. And we might say, Lord, I'm so not there right now. But God says, that's all right. I'm the master of teaching people how to get to places that in any other case, they would never be there. And so when we talk about uniting in our marriages, we know the goal. The unity, the oneness that God wants us to have, first of all, it cannot be accomplished except by his spirit. Amen? So please, start prioritizing to ask more for the presence of God's spirit in your life, to guide your mouth, to guide your actions, and to guide your thoughts. And listen to him when he convinces us of sin and points out Christ our righteousness. Make sure you're listening, because the one thing I know is in that little book, Ministry of Healing, that's my favorite book next to the Bible. In the book, Ministry of Healing, page 509, it says Christ is ever sending messages to those who are listening for his voice. And so you don't ever have to worry, is God speaking? You don't ever have to worry about that. Christ is ever sending messages. What you and I need to ask is, am I listening? Am I listening for his voice? That's what we need to be asking ourselves. Now listen, what we're talking about is formulas on how we can have an even happier marriage than we already have. I understand some of us are going through enduring. There's a lot of people right now, I endure my husband. I endure my wife. I tolerate him and I tolerate her. That may be where you are, but if you're there, I am so grateful that God knows how to take us from there to higher ground. Some of us are possibly contemplating escaping our marriages and have already crafted ways to do that. I just come home. I don't talk much. I don't say much to him. I don't say much to her. We mind our own business. We are cordial. We just answer the necessary questions, and we keep it moving. Now, literally, this this is unfortunately some homes. These, These are homes that I know of personally, okay? I know people who are living like this. I don't say much. We just say the little bit we have to say to keep it cordial. Because if we say too much, we end up in a fight. But there's very few people that are enjoying their marriages. I can't wait to see my bride. I can't wait to see my house band. And for those who are there, oh, bless your heart. Praise God. May you ever remain in that state. But please know, you are, shall I say, we are the minority. Now, God can fix that. What does he say? He says, no, understand, oneness is the goal. It always has been. Remember, the purpose of marriage is deeper than what you think. You're representing me. You're representing my relation to humanity and humanity's relation to me. And this is the greatest lesson you could teach to your children who watch you with brains that run like computers on download, fiber optic network speed. Kids are paying attention. They pay attention to everything. And so it is. What can we do? Well, here's a little tip. I'm serious. I thought about a lot that I could share with you on this, but this is one thing that I I think will, will help us a lot in our marriages as it relates to the subject of unity. We need to know the difference and the limit to this thing called unity when it comes to side issues versus living issues. I've realized that a lot of problems that I had with my wife and my wife had with me and a lot of people have with their spouses is you got this way that you think, right? They have this way that they think. Last I checked, a garden is beautiful because of its diversity, but for some reason when it comes to a marriage, it's like, We want our spouses to think like how we think. We want them to act how we would have acted. We want them to do and see it the way we see it. And after all, God just said he wanted us to be united in thoughts. 
but there's a limit to that principle. God wants us to be united in thoughts, feelings, and actions on living issues, not on side issues. And often in a marriage, side issues, if we're not careful, can turn into living issues. And we start having all this disunity in the home on subjects that really don't matter. And so that's the reason why I wanted to put this little study together for us on how can we know when we have this issue of disunity, my husband's not seeing it my way, my wife's not seeing it my way, how can we unite or is it necessary for us to unite? I would like to suggest if it's a living issue, you need to unite. You need to be one on it, thought, feeling, and action. But if it's a side issue, leave him alone. If it's a side issue, leave her alone. There's a difference between unity and uniformity. And God has not called us to uniformity that we do every single thing the same exact way in every little detail of living. So let's talk about it. Mark chapter 9. <laughs> let's go to Mark 9. All right, let's let the scripture speak. Praise the Lord. Mark chapter 9. Let's watch it. In Mark, the ninth chapter, let's, let's go ahead and take a look. We're going to learn an example. The first thing we're going to study about are side issues, okay? Side issues. And, and by the way, I'm going to just kill a lot of birds with one stone. Even as a church, let's keep in mind that what we're studying right now, this is true for church brethren as well, okay? This is not just limited to the marriage on this point. Marriage has a depth of intimacy that obviously is only in marriage. But there's some principles we're going to look at that even helps in church relationship, all right? Now watch what the Bible says in Mark 9. In Mark 9, verses 38 to 40, I like this. In Mark 9, verses 38 to 40, if you're there, say amen. amen. Okay, it says in verse 38, And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us. And we forbade him, because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, forbid him what? Forbid him not. Leave that brother alone. For there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. The disciples began to congratulate themselves because they were this chosen group. And so as a result of that, they felt that any work done in Jesus' name must go through us. We have to vet it. And so here it is. They finally run across somebody and they see, wait a minute. These brothers are preaching in Jesus' name too. That's our job. That's our position. And so what did they say? They said, mm, nope. We had to go over to them. Even though they paid no attention to what they were preaching. They paid no attention to the impact of what they were preaching and teaching. They didn't care about none of that. All they were concerned with was, are you, are you part of us? And so the Bible says that they went and forbade them. Hey, 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 stop. <laughs> they stopped them and said, only we do that. If you're not part of us, you don't have a right to do that. They felt good about themselves. And then they went back to Jesus. And when they went back to Jesus, Jesus says, you should never have did that. Jesus was like, were they exemplary? Was their message the same message that I gave y'all? Jesus said, if it was, hands off. Now, I have to admit, it was in volume five of the testimonies to the church that on this very point, that's the message that Sister White said to some of the, the brethren in the conference who were, who were trying to control the work for some of those who were anointed and appointed by God but did not go through their channels of education. And she literally used those words, hands off, brethren. She said, if their lives are exemplary and if their teachings are in harmony with the teachings, she says, take your hands off of them, leave them alone, let them work. Sometimes we get caught up and we make rules out of things that are not God's rules. So how can we take principles like this and, 
and bring it into what we're talking about. You see, there are cases and times where in our marriages, the wife says, if it were me, I would have answered differently. There are times where the husband says, if it were me, I would have responded differently. Well, that's okay until you start saying to your wife, and you should respond like how I respond. And when you say to the husband, and you should respond like how I respond, you should see it the way I see it. And when the husband or the wife says, I don't see it the way you see it, well, you need to see it the way I see it because my way is the right way to see it and your way is the wrong way to see it. And if we're not careful, we can let that stuff carry on to the point that we find ourselves not talking, angry, frustrated, separating bedrooms, and worse. What are some examples of side issues? What are some examples of side issues that can exist in a marriage? One wants to obtain great wealth. The other just wants to have their bills taken care of. Is that a real problem some people face? Last I checked, of the top five reasons that couples get divorced in the world and in the church, money is in the top five. Money's in that top five. So you have one spouse that says, I want to go ahead and obtain great wealth. The other spouse says, I just want to do enough just to pay the bills. The one who wants to make great wealth should not come down on the one who says, I just want to make enough to pay the bills. It's like, if that's where your head is at, then you go ahead and do that. But in like manner, if the one who wants to make great wealth, that other spouse should not go burdening them saying, you're becoming worldly. The Bible says, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get what? To get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. Then I went and magnified this, because that's what the writings of Mrs. White are. They are a magnifying glass. It's not an addition to the Bible. It's certainly not a subtraction from the Bible. It works like a magnifying glass. It just makes clearer what the Bible was already saying. So then I pulled out the magnifying glass. You know what the magnifying glass said? Right here. The desire to accumulate wealth is an original affection of our nature, implanted there by our heavenly Father for noble ends. Stop calling people worldly just because they want to get wealth. If you got a broke mentality, you live in your broke mentality. <laughs> but if you got a spouse that says, honey, I need to get us to higher ground, if they say, look, I want to go ahead and build a business. I want to do something to become an entrepreneur. I've realized J-O-Bs keep you just over broke. And I don't want to live like that anymore. And if they want to go ahead and build wealth and what have you, and they're saying, look, I'm not building wealth to leave you. I'm building wealth to help our home, help our family, and for many other noble ends. Don't hate on that partner. Build them up. Are you following Stop punishing each other and, oh, you're you becoming worldly now and all this stuff. Now, listen, if you say some other things that merit uh, your spouse saying you're becoming worldly, that's a different subject. But the mere desire to amass wealth, high six, seven figures, or even eight figures, that's not wrong. It's all about what you're doing with it. That's the question. But there are times that because one spouse is very ambitious and the other spouse is just calm and careful, I just want to make enough to pay the bills. That's it. I'm scared of wealth. It's going to make me ungodly. You know, I, I'll, I'll tell you this, because this is not my focus, but I'll tell you this. When we talk about come out of Babylon, I just want you to remember this one point. The idea that Poverty equals greater piety is 100% Babylonian thinking. I just want you to remember that. So for those who are talking about come out of Babylon, and if you heard the deep preachers talk about you got to come out of the Babylonian mindset, remember even Israel became a harlot. Jeremiah 3, read it for yourself. They had a harlot's mind. They had a harlot's forehead. Is that right? Yes. What I'm trying to tell you 
is that it is Babylonian thinking. It was the papacy that was boldly going around telling everybody that poverty equals greater piety. The more poor you are is the more holy you are. The more your car, the more your car clunks like this. There goes the holy man of God. Brother starts walking in his shoes and falling off. Look at that, look at that humble servant of the Lord. We need to stop that papal thinking. Are you following that? Stop that papal thinking. And stop hating on folks because they happen to drive a nice car. As long as they let you sit inside of it. I'm serious, beloved. We have these very weird human ways of judging folks. We want to see everybody in clunkers. And if they dare start riding in something nice, we, oh, must be nice. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we got all these comments. Somebody wears nice clothing. Sister Mason, out. well, <laughs> we had a fun time in England one time. I, it was a wonderful story of Brother Mason and all of us. We were in England. It, it, was, it was good. I'll, I'll, I'll save it for another time. I'll save it for I'll, I'll remind you of the story when we talk. <laughs> but the point is, family, some couples literally... They, they will actually say, well, because one wants to obtain great wealth, the other one just wants to make enough to pay the bills. That becomes a division issue where it doesn't need to be a division. It's a side issue. How about this one? The wife wants to wear even tone makeup, but the husband believes in all natural or nothing else. That's a side issue. If there's a few blemishes on the face and the person says, well, you know, I'm going to just put a little even tone makeup. It matches with my skin. And I'm going to put that on just so, you know, I don't magnify this blemish on my face. That doesn't mean that your wife has become Jezebel. Are you following what I'm saying? You see, I, I put this together because I knew I was amongst the present truth crowd. If I was amongst a liberal church, I'd have had a whole different scenario up here. <laughs> but I'm serious, beloved. Some spouses, nope, I don't want you wearing nothing that's fake or, or artificial of any kind. And we take the boat of Ellen White quotes and dump it on them. <laughs> Taking most of it out of context. There's a man by the name of Richard O'Phil. He now lays in the grave, I believe, awaiting the first resurrection. And Richard O'Phil said, if you give a man a pair of scissors and a Xerox gene, you can make Ellen White say whatever you want. <laughs> There's a lot of truth to that. But the reality is, is that there's nothing wrong if somebody says, you know what, I'm putting on a little even tone makeup or what have you, and, you know, that's it. I don't understand how you can get bad on somebody with even tone makeup and then wear fake hair. That, I'm just like, what's that about? Ouch. Right? Now, I don't have any problem with it. Again, I don't have any problem with people wear, do what they do with their hair for different reasons. So I'm not here as a critique on hair and, and all that stuff. I'm just simply saying that some of, the, <laughs> some of the overtly critical people are the same ones that you know you have store-bought hair on your head. <laughs> and now you're going to get on this person because they're putting on even tone makeup. Stop it. So again, this is, this is a side issue. If the husband says, I'm not putting any even tone makeup on my face, good for you, brother. And if the wife comes along and says, well, I want to put a little on, you know, just feel, it makes me feel a little more presentable while I'm working on some things to, to, you know, get myself to a different place. That's fine, too. That's not what was being talked about when we think of those quotes that talks about the colorful cosmetics and all the rest. It's not what it's talking about. Here's another one. One wants an off-grid country home, and the other wants to be on the grid. That's a side issue. Off-grid is not a criterion, one, for country living. And it's definitely not a salvational issue. Being off-grid, I know plenty of demons that are off-grid. I mean, they are off-grid and they are the spawn of Satan. So the idea that... <laughs> You know, off-grid, again, off-grid is a plus. I'm off-grid. I'm off-grid, okay? I live in the mountains, and I'm off-grid. But I got tricked into it. <laughs> I'm, I'm being honest with you. I got tricked into it. Saw the property, good price, good location, 
it was great in every way. And I said, well, boy, I like this. And I came there. It only had like 12 solar panels and stuff. Little old lady, 85 years old, who was living there. And I was like, I like this house. And so we decided to buy the house. Called the electric company. I was like, can we get a pole out to this house? And they was like, yes, sir, we can. I was like, I don't trust you. I want to talk to an engineer. They put me on the phone with an engineer. What's your address? I gave him the address, everything. He said, yep we can get a pole out to the house. I was like, you sure? Yes, send me an email saying that. I wanted documentation because documentation beats conversation. So he sends me an email. We can do it. We can get there. So I said, praise, praise the Lord. Bought the house. Bought the house. I was so happy. And then next thing you know, what did I do? I called the electric company. I said, hey, get me my pole. They said, no problem, Mr. Lemon. Two million dollars. I was like... What? I am not making this up. He said, two million dollars. I said, two million dollars? I said, wait, you forgot those details. And he said, listen, you asked me if we can get a pole to your house. You never asked me how much it would cost. I don't have that kind of money. So obviously, I said, honey, we got to live off grid. And so from that, we made all the investments in inverters and yeah. lithium batteries, and we went from 12 to 52 solar panels. Now we got a whole off-grid suite. Yeah. And I have to admit, it is nice. <laughs> no, I mean, I like it. I was like, man, I kind of like this. So th it's a blessing for sure, but it's not a criterion. I was fully ready to go ahead and be on grid and have no problem. And we cannot make these things a test. We can't make this the present truth. You know, if somebody, are you living off grid? It's almost like it's our tone of voice shows we're ready to judge you. <laughs> our tone of voice already shows we're ready to judge you. I got a country home, but is it off grid? <laughs> and it's just like, what is that? Why do we do that? What is wrong with us? We all know how to celebrate when somebody accomplishes something good. We live by that thing called the crab theory. I understand we're all Adventists. But once upon a time when I ate crabs, I remember that I used to watch those things in the bucket, and every time one crab would climb on top of another crab to get out to the top. And then once a crab looked like it was almost getting ready to get out, another crab would grab his leg and pull him back down. From that day on, my father called that the crab theory. He said, Dwayne, watch out for people in your life that live by the crab theory. Every time you try to climb high and accomplish something, they're ready to pull you back down. Misery does love company. That's a side issue, beloved. Whether the husband or the wife says, look, I want an off-grid home. The other one says, I want an on-grid home. Commit it to prayer and let God's will be done because whether you have an off-grid or an on-grid country home, at least you're in the country. Praise the Lord. Amen. Lastly, one ever so often watches innocent televised programs. The other spouse just reads books. That's a side issue. That's a side issue. I just read today, let's see, manuscript release, book 19, page 300 to 303. Thank the Lord I remembered. Manuscript release, book 19. Page 300 to 303. It actually was a Christmas play that was done. What kind of play? It was a Christmas play. And Mrs. White actually said, she gave some critiques of what could have been done better. But do you know what she said when it got to the acting of the little children, when they were acting like angels and all that stuff? She said the acting was very good. And I'm thinking to myself, Sister White commented positively about acting. And here goes those lopsided readers that didn't know that that was a comment that she said. So if somebody says, ever so often, I like watching an innocent televised program that is uplifting, Bible-based, encourages me to be a better husband, father, or something like that, leave him alone. If you like reading your books, read your books. That's a wonderful thing to do. But if you got a spouse that says, I read books too, but ever so often, I like to watch an innocent 
televised program that is uplifting and biblical based and what leave that brother alone. Don't touch him. And leave your wife alone. Don't start calling her names, you know, book geek and bookworm. If, if, if she wants to read, let her read. Are you following me? These are side issues. It's crazy how we let this stuff separate us and cause undue problems in our marriage. And I'm sure you all can add a thousand more examples. Let's go ahead and let's close it out. Brethren should not feel that it is a virtue to stand apart because they do not see all what kind of points? Minor points in exactly the same light. If they agree on fundamental truths, they should not differ and dispute about matters of little real importance. To dwell on perplexing questions that, after all, are of no vital consequence tends to call the mind away from truths vital to the saving of the soul. Brethren, brethren should be very modest in urging these side issues, which often they do not themselves understand, points that they do not know to be truth and that are not essential to what? Salvation. That's the side issue, family. If it's not essential to salvation, it's a side issue. Why are we making such a big deal out of this? If one spouse believes the 144,000 is literal, the other spouse believes the 144,000 is symbolic, that doesn't mean that it's a salvational issue. There's going to be a lot of people in heaven that says, oh, I thought it was symbolic. There's going to be a lot of people in heaven that's going to say, I thought it was literal. It's not a salvational issue. You don't have to disunite. You don't have to suddenly have disunity as a result of these side issues. Continuing, it says, I have been shown that it is the device of the enemy to divert men's minds to some obscure or unimportant point, something that is not fully revealed or is not essential to salvation. This is made the absorbing theme, the present truth, when all the investigations and suppositions only serve to make matters more obscure and to confuse the minds of some who ought to be seeking for oneness through sanctification of the truth, beloved. This is where our focus should be, side issues. Well, I'd be remiss if I did not give you some living issues. Let me do it quickly. Summary, anything that pulls us away from the essential salvational truths as well as experience needed to be ready for the final crisis and second coming of Jesus are side issues. Don't fight and don't disunite over side issues, beloved. Guard your hearts against that, okay? Living issues. Living issues. John chapter 3, verse 5. Let's turn there very quickly. John 3 and verse 5. In John 3 and verse 5, we have an idea of the, point, the foundation to living issues, okay? The foundation to all living issues. It's found in John 3 and verse 5. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at it. In John 3 and verse 5, the Bible says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, unto thee, except the man be what? Born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. There are some things that everybody must be united on. You cannot say, I don't want to be born of the water, but I want to be born of the Spirit. You cannot say, I want to be born of the Spirit, but I don't be born. You can't do that. If God puts the prescription out, we have to take the whole pill. What are some examples? What are some examples where God begins to talk to us about living issues? Here's one. Ignoring or being indifferent to each other's needs, mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual. That's a living issue. Husbands, you got to avail yourself to understand where your wife is coming from. You got to make the effort. Wives, you got to make the effort to understand where is my husband coming from. I don't see it, but what happens if you sit down and say, honey, help me see what you see. Do not become indifferent to the mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual needs. Too often in marriage, especially after children and enough hormonal changes, The men typically still have a drive that sadly the sisters begin to lose that drive and a neglect begins to fall on husbands 
because the wife is no longer paying attention to the physical needs. Not cool. Not good. If it's as a result of trauma, address your trauma. We'll talk about that tomorrow. If it's as a result of some other issue. But unfortunately, especially in the counseling that I do, there's a lot of women in the church who believes, they say, the present truth, that they know that, look, it's like there are physical needs in a marriage. You waited until marriage, and now in marriage, you still saying no? It's like that needs to, that, that, <laughs> I'm just saying it needs to be talked about. Don't be indifferent. Don't ignore. Don't ignore that. Are you following, family? It's like, the, do not ignore the mental, emotional, because typically the brothers are on the side of erring when it comes to ignoring and being indifferent to the mental, emotional needs of their wife. Typically, the wife is the one that is ignoring or being indifferent to the physical needs of the husband. In truth, she needs it too. But she's just not aware of it. But the point is, is that, and then there's the spiritual need. Then there's the spiritual need. Brothers, don't surrender your leadership, your priesthood. You are called to lead your home. After Eve messed up part of the judgment, God says the wife is going to look to the husband for leadership. She looks to him. And so it is. That's why tomorrow in the afternoon, when we start talking about the family and the final crisis, we're going to talk about roles. I can't wait to talk about that one. It's a good study. It's a good study. But the point is, is that do not ignore and don't become indifferent to each other's needs. Mental, emotional. That's a formula for disaster in a marriage. Is when the wife is clearly trying to tell you she's crying out and you're like, I don't know, that's not my problem. I got to pay the bills. I got to work hard. I, I just, I can't. And the next thing you know, that brother, he's trying to go ahead and have certain needs filled. And she's like, sorry, I am being in kind right now. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Real stuff. Do not, that's a living issue. You can destroy a marriage if we ignore this counsel. What's the next one? Children's education. One spouse focuses only on the spiritual development. The other spouse focuses on academic and spiritual. I told you, I put my messages together according to the crowd. You have no idea how many children have almost gotten to a place that they hate God because all they got was spiritual nurturing and their academic needs were completely neglected. That's fanaticism. You cannot read the book Christ Object Lessons. You cannot read the chapter talents. And when you go through the subject of talents, there's a specific chapter in there that talks about mental faculties. And when in you get to that chapter on mental faculties, it talks about how we should be bringing up and training our children to be excellent in their mind in all the fields of their life. You don't want to just focus on the spiritual because that's never heaven's counsel. You can't show one verse in the Bible or one verse in Mrs. White's quotes where we focus on the spiritual only. We go around telling people that they need to just do stuff, and, and we use these, these sloppy quotes. And you got folks walking away from school, walking away to everything else. You got a whole bunch of mothers homeschooling their children, and those mothers never been schooled themselves. It's a formula for disaster. We begin to demonize academia, and that is not what inspiration says. And I especially say this when I'm here in the South. Too many of my black brothers and sisters as ignorant as all get out. We do, we, I mean, we barely know how to pronounce certain words right. And we, think, and we almost think it virtuous. And then we hand this down to our children and make them think this is the image of God. Our children grow up hating God. Why do you think, why do you think, especially in the black community, why do you think that a lot of our children, once they get to 18, they are like, out. It's because of these, these poor, foul applications of present truth. 
that we brought to the minds of these kids. And we did not give them the balanced realities. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. Some of us fathers, we think we're doing all right. And listen, don't get me wrong, man. You probably are genuine, all right? Probably. I'm, I don't know you, but I'm just saying. You're probably very genuine with it. I get it. But what I'm saying is, is that sincerity is a virtue, but it's not the test of sound doctrine. You can be sincerely wrong. And you can hurt your children. I often sometimes look at some of these kids. I'm like, are the parents seeing the face that I'm seeing? Some of these kids are like, I'm out of here. You forcing me right now, so I'll follow what you say. But once I turn 18 and I get some rights to freedom, I'm out. And it'll be all because of you. I don't want that legacy on my head. I don't want that. So there are too many of us that when it comes to education, we, we, we have this hyper spiritual focus. It's not to say don't be spiritual. That's not the point. Of course you can be spiritual, but you need to be intentional to make sure that the other areas of their mental faculties are being used as well. That's a living issue. You can teach your children indirectly to hate God because you're the picture of God to them. And even though you might have a convenient Ellen White quote here or there, I can guarantee you there are some other quotes that will balance you off to the good readers. What's another living issue? One spouse disregards the laws of health and the other takes it seriously. Can't do that. That's a living issue. The laws of health are the laws of God. We cannot look at the laws of health and think it's just a la carte. I choose what I want. I'll take this law seriously. That one, nah, I have no time for that. We can't do that, beloved. That's a living issue. Because remember, Romans 7 and verse 25, we serve the law of God with our minds. And what you and I eat and drink gets broken down to blood. That blood is what feeds our brain. Our brain houses our mind. Our mind is where we have our thoughts. Our thoughts is what produces our actions. Our actions repeated is what forms our habits. And our habits is what forms our characters. And our characters determine our destiny. This is why the laws of health are the laws of God. We must take them seriously. And be careful if you're in a marriage where one spouse is disregarding these laws of health while the other spouse is trying to take it seriously. That's a living issue that we need to do all that we can to seek by the grace of God, through the power of his spirit, how can we become united? Lastly, one spouse ignores home religion and the other takes it seriously. Brothers and sisters, woe be unto me. I, I'm, I'm speaking from my heart, all right? Woe be unto me when I am a different man than what I am inside of this sanctuary at my home. I have no desire to act. I just don't. I have no desire to act. I am WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. And my brothers and sisters, you want to make sure that you do not neglect home religion. Don't be some holy guy in the sanctuary or in a Bible study, but then we're a completely different person when we get home. You make sure that you are still a man of God when you're home, when you have your cell phone with all of its 5G speed, all by yourself in a dark room. It's like make sure that you're still the same man of God. You make sure you're the same still woman of God, daughter of God. Do not neglect home religion. That is a living issue. Make sure that the principles that you teach, worship, prayer. There's a lot of husbands and wives that don't study together. There's a lot of husbands and wives that do not intercess and pray together. God is saying, you need and I need, we need to build up our home religion. We don't want to be something at home different than where we are amongst the crowd and the throng. It's a living issue, family. And for a lot of us, that's what it is. Some of us can't wait to leave church because when we go home, we get to unzip. <laughs> Heaven says, please don't do that. 
That's not the will of God. That's not the desire of God. Let's bring it to a close. It's, it is no time now to relax our efforts, to become dull and spiritless. No time to hide our light under a bushel, to speak smooth things, and to prophesy deceit. Every power is to be employed for God. You are to maintain your allegiance, bearing testimony for God and for truth. Do not be turned aside by any suggestion the world may make. We cannot afford to compromise. If there is a living issue before us of vital importance to the remnant people of God to the very close of this earth's history, for eternal interests are involved. On the very eve of the crisis, it is no time to be found with an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. Got to take those living issues seriously, family. Side issues? We can leave those things alone. Living issues, we must address them. We must for good unity in the marriage. Summary, anything that has a clear and direct impact upon our salvation and witness to others for salvation are living issues. So when we study tonight about unity, we know God wants it. We know through the power of his spirit we can have it. We know it's always going to be based on truth, but we also had to decipher what are the living issues we need to be united on, what are the side issues that we need to respect our differences, and we don't have to be united on them. And so we could still have a wonderful, 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 loving marriage. Things that we can do to have more unity. Number one, when appropriate, from the heart, apologize for being indifferent to each other's needs and interests. There's a place for that. Number two, allow each other to be different on side issues without any direct or indirect pressure. Again, leave each other alone. Let, if you're different, okay, no problem. Number three, pertaining to living issues, write down your issues and see what the Word of God says on the matter. Do this with hearts that are submissive to God's will. Number four, pray with and for each other's weaknesses. Do this in a non-threatening way. Don't, don't, don't use prayer as a weapon. Sometimes people do that kind of stuff. Don't do that. Don't do that. Oh, Lord, please help my husband. He's so unconverted. It's like, don't do that. Don't do that. That is wrong. That is wrong. You want to pray. Father, I believe my husband's doing his best, but he acknowledges there's an area of weakness. Teach me how to be more of a true bride from his side to build him up and to help him in the ways that he needs help. Do the same praying for your beloved brides as well. Lastly, explore each other's interests to seek understanding and possible adaptation to each other's likes. You actually might like it. The more you try to understand each other, you might come along and say, you know what, I, I, I misunderstood. I, didn't, I thought it was something else. But you know what, I kind of like this. And before you know it, you might even win your partner on some of your side issues, let alone both of you being one to the living issues. I have a question. How many of us understood our study tonight? Did you understand the study tonight? Brothers and sisters, God says that he wants us to have biblical unity, unity in our marriages, that we can reflect heaven to the world. Wouldn't it be nice if one day we can go home and say, I want to go home? And somebody says, why do you want to go home? And we can say from our hearts, because my home is a little heaven on earth. Yes. I understand some of us may not be able to say that right now, but God's not through with us yet. And God wants to do something special in your heart and in mine. And so if you want God to bring you to this more precious, beautiful place in unity in your marriage, and for those of us who are single, should it be that you get married, that you're going to make these principles the governing rules of your life. So whether it's single or married, if you're willing to let these principles be the governing rule in your life for the homes established now or the home that shall be established in the near future, should it be the Lord's will, stand to your feet with me. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. Let's watch God do something special. Amen. Amen. I'm so thankful for his wonderful words of life. Let's pray, beloved. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for the gift of life. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the way that you have spoken to us tonight, Lord. We know that it is your desire that they too shall be one. 
And Lord, we have learned very powerful principles of unity in the marriage. Please, God, help us that we might abide by these principles, that we might experience the power of the gospel and have an opportunity to reflect heaven's relationship with humanity and humanity with heaven. We thank you for this privilege, Lord. Bless our homes, we pray, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want to thank God. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask besides? Can I doubt his tender mercies whom through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort.